Uh, what I hope to talk about today is really the way that drug discovery, and to be honest with you, cancer medicine is radically changing. And we, I guess we anticipated that this would come for a while, this so-called promise of targeted therapy or personalized medicine. Uh, but it really seemed, I have to say, through the course of years, as Megan alluded to so politely that I was training, uh, that, that really it might not arrive. Now, its arrival has brought two observations, I should say, with sort of a lab coat on. And that is, one, there's incredible promise. And there's a lot to be very optimistic about. And then secondly, there's incredible complexity. And there's a lot to be concerned about. And so this is an interesting, even summer, to have this conversation. Because we're actually right at the inflection point in our understanding of cancer on the individual level, the person who comes to our clinic. And this is against the backdrop of years and years of focused and passionate and committed research. We're just at the moment where the patient that walks in the door, we can address the question, why do I have cancer? Now, understanding someone's cancer is a bit like understanding historical events. It doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be able to intervene for that person, certainly not in a, in a targeted or personalized way. And that's then the promise of personalized medicine, what sort of lies ahead. So really, in this post-genomic era, thanks in large part to the research that's occurred in this building and by the faculty who built this building, uh, we have an unprecedented understanding of the hardwiring of the cancer cell, the personalized aspect of it we now have in spades. The challenge is actually the medicine. We lack the tools, the reagents, the molecules, the pills uh, to give our patients. And, and it, it's starting to make some of us in the discipline wonder, can we trust that these medicines will appear? Um, is there an equal revolution in chemistry, the science of, of making molecules, or to our taste, cancer drugs, that can accompany this genome revolution that has transformed our ability to understand the disease? And so that's the theme of what I'll talk about in this uh, Midsummer Night's uh, series. And, and you can now have a Midsummer Night's dream and fall asleep because you know what the whole thing's about. So um, I hope by the end uh, uh, to get to a, a new and emerging story right out of our lab that we're very excited about um, that I think illustrates in, in one sort of tight scenario uh, the change that's happening in cancer medicine. The change from thinking about cancer as a disease of genes, I'm sorry, of, of organs and treating it like a disease of organs by organ specialists to thinking about it as a disease of genes and treating it with new and revolutionary molecules that target the protein products of those genes. So hopefully we'll get there. I think we probably will. So it doesn't quite matter what I think cancer is. It matters what Wikipedia thinks cancer is. And so <laughs> I've shared with you some of the distillation of that information. And it's, it's actually a moving target. Um, this is a patient I took care of who has, as by PET scan, the uptake of glucose is marking a large cancer in his chest. Cancer is really an impossibly heterogeneous group of diseases. And I'll touch more on that in a little bit as we talk about cancer genomics and genome sequencing. But they all have in common a phenotype, a function, an observation in the clinic, that of sustained and rapid growth with a resistance to death. And beyond that, cancers are actually quite diverse in their presentation to the clinic and the way that they're managed and the experience for patients who have cancer. And I don't, I'm sure, have to say that probably everyone in this room has been touched in some way. Uh, by this uh, horrible disease, either personally uh, or through your extended uh, uh, network of friends and, and, and relatives. But really throughout the history of cancer, it's always been described by a certain nomenclature that has tied back to the tissue of origin. People identify as having breast cancer. They identify as having liver cancer. And this is important, certainly surgically, where major inroads to cancer treatment were first made for solid tumors, uh, because you would want to go to a surgeon who's familiar with the anatomy of, let's say, the breast versus the pancreas. It's quite a different procedure. But for advanced cancer, this description of the organ where it originated from is actually quite a bit less relevant. Because these advanced cancers, certainly when they're out of the barn and spreading throughout the body, are treated more based on their responsiveness to drugs, or their possible responsiveness to drugs and radiation. And at that point, the tissue of origin sort of breaks down as a major determinant of prognostic and treatment type information.
But cancer is a genetic disease, and, and not genetic like we usually think of uh, having brown hair or um, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, some other body trait. It's, it's, it's somatic changes. It's, it's changes that accompany either the formation of the baby, the embryo, or, or later on, the ongoing function of the vital organs. And this is sort of a, a, a characteristic description of the complement of normal chromosomes. And this is a description of what happens in cancer cells. Sort of from a 30,000 foot view, believe it or not, this was sort of high tech even 20, 30 years ago, the chromosomes are switching partners. The color coding is resulting in changes, exchanges of information. The cancer genome degenerates. So for a while now, we've thought of cancer as having genetic underpinnings, but we never really characterized it in this genetic way in the clinic. You still go to the breast clinic, and you still would at Dana-Farber uh, today or tomorrow. But what's changing and, and why people in my discipline of discovery chemistry are so excited is that the clinicians and the patients and that the drug companies and the regulators are starting to think of cancer less in terms of where does it come from, but what's its hardwiring? such that someday, knowing that you have a mutation in the KIT oncoprotein or the EGFR cancer-causing protein, you might go to the KIT clinic or the EGFR clinic or the signaling clinic or the transcription clinic. Yeah? It's a great question. So the question was, how often are the changes observed in cancer clinically this radical, if you think this is radical, versus something so subtle as a single base pair mutation? It turns out, and this is, again, work I'll quote from Ramin Barakim and others at, in this building, it turns out that in adult common cancers, the epithelial cancers of the colon, the pancreas, the breast, that changes in the chromosomal structure, amplifications, deletions, and translocations, the swapping of large segments, is actually extremely common. It's more the rule than the exception. But in pediatric patients who never smoked, never did anything wrong, never breathed in this toxic oxygen that causes damage to DNA, yet keeps us alive, um, in pediatric cancers, the possibility, the, the proportion of genetic changes that are subtle, like you're asking, is, is quite a bit higher. Um, but I will say that we lack an accounting of the subtle changes right now. And so it's really not possible to answer your question specifically. But generally speaking, this is actually very common. Um, that's a good time also to say, please chime in. Uh, this, you know, I'm going to keep us all awake. All right. Um, so I'll break it down to sort of these, what I personally find terrifying numbers. These are numbers that are hopefully all going up as we understand and treat this disease better. But with the combined sequencing efforts of the dominant programs in this, the Broad, the Sanger, Hopkins, Washington, St. Louis, we now know that there are over 40,000 unique genetic changes at the sequence level that can be found in human cancer. And that these 40,000 changes affect more than 10,000 genes. Now, some of these changes are bystanders, what we call passengers. But some of these changes are actually causing the cancer. They're capable of turning a non-cancerous cell into the cancerous cell. And a major problem, a major challenge in cancer research right now for anyone in high school here that's thinking about jumping into this is trying to figure out which of these 10,000 are among the smaller number of 500 mutated or activated or translocated proto or future cancer proteins that actually cause cancer. What are the drivers amongst this sea of genetic information? And with the rate at which genome sequencing is dropping in its expense, and the rate at which then data is being generated at unprecedented levels, these numbers are going to staggeringly increase. And what it will take is understanding exactly what are the special cohort of cancer-causing genes and who has them. So as a biologist, I'd say it's actually very exciting to finally understand cancer at this level. But as a doctor, it's a little scary. Because of these 500 potential targets for therapy, we have 10 classes of targeted therapeutic agents. So this revolution, believe me, has been genomic. But it must be accompanied by a comparable revolution in drug discovery. And so training at a time when this revolution was happening and trying to sort of surf along the you know, leading wave of this 
I got to realizing that unless I learn more about chemistry, how to make drugs, how to modify drugs to make them better, it, it would be, um, well, it'd be hard to imagine a future with better uh, cancer therapies. And so that really then became the focus of, of my, my interest in research. So I've broken this talk down into three segments, two quick segments, because they're not, not things I'm an expert in and they're things I think many people know. And then the last, which is what exactly I've just talked about, where these new cancer drugs might come from. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the epidemiology, sort of the way in which cancer affects us all. Secondly, a little bit about what causes cancer and how we now understand that at the genetic level. And then finally, and at much greater extent, talk about therapy, where it came from and where it's going. So suffice it to say that around the time I was born to around the time my son was born, the incidence of cancer um, is, is about the same. And it represents a significant proportion um, of deaths uh, worldwide. In fact, it's one of the leading causes of death, third overall, uh, compared to heart disease and this garbage bag that includes everything else on the pie chart. The incidence of cancer is extremely high. And it always, uh, and I say this knowing people from my lab are here, it always makes me wonder why they leave at night. Because, you know, you'd never leave if someone was having a heart attack. You'd stay with them, you'd resuscitate them. It's an emergency. Cancer is an emergency. People die slowly, but there's so many people affected by this disease, well, that they're dying every couple of seconds. And so we must recognize, I think, that at this moment where we've had this unprecedented amount of information, it's just not actionable without the development of better therapeutic agents. Now let's look at heart disease. And at Brigham and Women's Hospital, where I practice, we have this healthy rivalry between cardiology and oncology for space, funding, finances, attention. Um, the front page of our little reader. And, and they would say that the development of targeted therapy in heart disease, the statin drugs for cholesterol, the selective inhibitors of the beta adrenergic receptor or beta blocker, and the understanding of the function and use of aspirin and platelet drugs like Plavix, that these targeted therapies in heart disease have produced incredible survival changes in the natural history of that disease, and they're right. A lot of this has been prevention. The majority of cancer research, of course, focuses on treatment. But it wouldn't be a very good conversation about treating cancer or influencing cancer without mentioning things like cigarette smoking. It shocks me it's still legal if you know the connection between this dominant cancer-causing habit um, and the incredible morbidity on human health. But beyond that, the overall incidence of cancer would not change, and the overall outcomes for cancer comparatively also not changing. So look at the influence that the development of preventive strategies and active medications can have. And we've observed it in heart disease, a body of scientific literature that's maybe a decade behind what we observe in cancer, yet the implementation of this information is really so much more robust. So I think there's actually quite a lot to learn from the development of better therapeutic approaches and preventive approaches to these and other diseases. What causes cancer? Why do we get cancer? Well, fundamentally, cancer is a genetic disease. It can affect really almost any cell in your body, certainly any cell that has the capacity to undergo division. I have a four-year-old, and he has a set. He's hopefully going to grow. He seems to every month. He has a, a set of genes for growth. It's genes that will allow a liver cell to become two liver cells, that will allow a blood cell to become two blood cells. And this is, of course, important for development. Our bodies are hardwired to grow, but at a certain point, only the abdomen grows, right? <laughs> because we've naturally silenced the growth in many, many organs. So what cancer does is it tricks the cell to reactivate the old growth program. And it does this through genetic changes. Maybe you're exposed to some carcinogen, like cigarette smoke. Maybe it's just breathing oxygen. There's accumulated oxidative damage to the genome that's typically edited with great fidelity, but you undergo so many divisions through your life, well, that they add up. And suffice it to say, when this cell capable of growth slams down the accelerator, the oncogenes are turned on, and the brake pedal is genetically cut off, the tumor suppressors are removed, well, then what results is sustained, non-natural proliferation or growth of a tissue of your body. And that's cancer. 
Now, these so-called hallmarks of cancer from the Weinberg Laboratory have really been a guiding principle for the biology of cancer. How does it function? Well, it grows without normal uh, um, impulses. Anti-growth signals don't turn it off. It invades into tissues where it shouldn't live. The colon's not supposed to be in the lung, yet colon cancer frequently travels there. It can go on and divide and divide and divide forever, where normally there should be a limit to how many cell divisions a cell can undergo. It recruits its own blood supply to maintain its addiction to sugar, and it prevents itself from undergoing cell death, which is actually a natural phenomenon for most cells in the body. So this is the biology of cancer, but all of these biological functions are underlined by signaling networks. Like the software on your computer, which is capable of running Microsoft Word or you know, a web browser, the cancer genome is fully equipped to make an eye, a liver, an arm. It, of course, never does that. It just keeps making cancer. And so our laboratory has been very interested in understanding how does cancer remember to do these things, and could we make molecules that would cause it to forget? So could we attack the underlying hardwiring of cancer? And there's a lot of rich biology that we wade through. We understand exactly how cells cycle, how they synthesize S, their DNA, and how they undergo mitosis or cell division M. But instead of exiting to become a heart cell or a neuronal cell, they just keep endlessly cycling, making a cancer cell. We understand the normal signals that lead to cell growth, the way that one cell comes in contact to, to another, and it gets a little smack in the tush from this cell. A signal is sent from the outside of the cell through protein functions into the nucleus of the cell. Right? This is the hard drive of the cell, where all the information is stored. And it turns on a gene expression program where the growth genes are turned on and the death genes are turned off. Now, that's a natural process. But in this complex slide, because signaling is impossibly complex in cancer, you can see in red numerous proteins within this network that cancer utilizes in a rogue way to sort of take over the growth network to keep it endlessly and endlessly growing. So against sort of that critical epidemiologic challenge, and against this incredible vast amount of biological understanding and emerging genetic information, you, well, you'd like to think that we'd make really smart and targeted therapeutics agents. Right? So I want to talk a little bit about the way cancer is treated now in the 21st century at Harvard, uh, at Dana-Farber, and, um, and, and then show you uh, the limitations of, of what we can do for people and the way in which we're, we're trying to attack that problem. So the way that we approach cancer is through its hallmark clinical manifestations. We try to figure out what is the pathologic diagnosis? What tissue did it seem to come from? What are the drivers of this cancer as best we can now measure? How aggressive does this cancer look? Under a microscope, you can tell a patient a lot about how long they might live. We then look for where in the body is it located, what we call stage. We take careful attention to what the patient is experiencing to see if either through treating the cancer or symptoms, we can improve their quality and hopefully extend their life. And then finally, we put a team together of maybe a surgeon, a radiation specialist, and a medical doctor to converge on this patient's care with really every trick in our, our arsenal. And these are sort of a list of the therapeutic modalities we have access to. Surgery to remove cancers if you can radiation to bombard them and prevent them from spreading locally, biological therapies to use the immune system and steer it towards the cancer, hormone modulatory therapy to, under, to attack what underlies the cancer. You might know that uh, a major drug for breast cancer is tamoxifen, and this estrogen receptor that it targets, maybe one of the first examples of targeted therapy, well, it's not like mutated in, in breast cancer, but to be breast tissue, you need to have an estrogen receptor. And so if you turn it off, well, some breast tissue is lost, and with it goes the cancer. This works in prostate cancer, too. And that's what we call attacking tissue identity. I do stem cell transplantation. And this is sort of, I have to say, a, an odd experience as a physician scientist, because my clinical practice is to take care of patients with this, I mean, medieval procedure 
of bombarding them with what would be a lethal dose of radiation and infusing what would be a lethal dose of chemotherapy. And at the moment where their immune system is completely depleted, transplanting in a healthy person's immune system, and then hoping that as this immune system kicks in, in this period where they're like a bubble baby, they don't have a severe infection or a bleeding complication, and then as, that, as that immune system returns, hopefully it too will recognize the cancer is foreign. It's not targeted therapy, it's actually quite the opposite. It's a heavy sledgehammer, but it does work for advanced cancers where yet we have no targeted therapy. But what I'll talk about for the rest of this session is chemotherapy, largely small molecules that you can administer to patients for therapeutic benefit. And I'll break it up into two sections, historical and really current chemical therapy, what you hear about and see on TV um, makes people sick, they lose their hair, but it does work. And then secondly, targeted therapy, which is this sort of brave new world. So it's fair to say that we arrived at most of the active chemotherapeutic drugs in blood cancers, which I treat, largely by accident, sifting through molecules that had certain toxicities and saying, well, if this molecule is so toxic to dividing cells, maybe there's a dose I could give a human and the cancer, which so rapidly divides, would be sensitive, but the, we'd find a narrow therapeutic window where the patient uh, would, wouldn't die and the cancer would. And so really from insights derived from warfare, you might know that nitrogen musters were one of the first, if not the first, types of chemotherapeutic agents. And these were substances that were used to bomb the Italians in the World War. And what happens is these soldiers became lymphopenic. They lost their lymphatic tissue. And so enterprising pharmacologists thought to themselves, well, wow, maybe if you had too much lymphatic tissue, like lymphoma, that there would be a dose of these drugs we could give where this sensitive tissue, the lymphatic system, uh, would die and, and the rest of the body could live. And that idea of the therapeutic window is a guiding principle of our current treatment and the development of these other cancers. Find the most of this drug that a human can take and hope that it, the cancer depends on its target uh, more than the rest of the body. And so these insights and others led to the development through mouse models at the NCI and other places of the first cohort of active drugs against cancer. And at Dana-Farber, the recognition that rapidly growing cells, like rapidly growing tissues, so rely on folic acid for the synthesis of DNA that antifolates might represent effective drugs to target, in that case, leukemia cells, and they worked. But as single agents, they didn't work well enough. And it was true in lymphoma as it was in leukemia. And so this concept of cocktails or combination therapies emerge. And that's the second still guiding principle of drug development in cancer today. Find active drugs that cancer hates more than the body and then combine them together and hope that they're still tolerated. So this series of events that led to the active treatment of acute lymphoblastic leukemia, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, active chemotherapeutic approaches were really largely clinical inferences completely devoid of any genetic information, bedside to bedside research. And I will say that the current treatment for acute lymphoblastic leukemia in adult and pediatric patients has evolved clinically, largely without genetic measurements, to this epic two to three year course of therapy that sequentially, month after month, assaults patients with very toxic substances in combination to establish remission where we can no longer detect cancer and then to keep hitting it down until hopefully it never comes back, which we call cure after about five years. And if you look at the substances in these cocktails, these are not targeted agents. Here's an enzyme prepared in E. coli. Here's the modern derivative of the drug that um, Sidney Farber developed uh, in leukemia. This is a drug that attacks uh, uh, DNA, a drug that attacks mi uh, the microtubule network, and steroids. These are heavy hammers, but their combination has proven curative in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. I'll tell you about a patient that I took care of recently, a young kid from Cape Cod. And beyond the chemotherapy, I think another great advance of developing curative approaches in cancer has been the ability to support patients through this difficult time. It's meant specialized nursing. 
It's meant the specialization of nutritionists. It's meant a HEPA-filtered air system. Um, and it means numerous supportive medications and deployment of antibiotics. And these are the drugs that this young man was exposed to in the first month that we cared for him. It's an arsenal of medications that are brought to bear on the treatment of patients with cancer. But the outcomes are so striking. Steve Salen, visionary chief of staff at Dana-Farber, has lent me this slide that captures the accomplishments of his career from the 70s, where the first curative approaches to acute lymphoblastic leukemia in children were realized. And then by just adjusting the knobs on this cocktail ever so slightly, largely in the up direction, the curative approach to ALL has become so effective that the vast majority of children that have this most common disease of childhood, cancer disease of childhood, um, are largely mostly cured. And this is without any targeted therapy. And this is largely without genetic information. So the problem is that this worked so well in liquid tumors, lymphoma and leukemia, but it really did not translate into solid tumors, which are, of course, quite a bit more common. And it took a new way of thinking to bring drugs forward for these types of cancers. And we'll spend the rest of the time talking about this concept of what we call targeted therapy. Now, targeted therapy has many definitions. And I don't have a favorite definition. But I can tell you the way we think about it. It's a drug that was developed like a molecular key to fit in the keyhole pocket of a protein target. And that this protein target is implicated directly in the pathogenesis of cancer. Maybe it's mutated. Maybe it's fused to a protein that keeps it constitutively active on all the time. Maybe it's a critical cancer dependency of the tissue itself, like the estrogen receptor in breast cancer. But by chemically optimizing the structure of this molecule, like fine tuning a key for a keyhole, eventually you get to a substance, a pure substance, a single molecule that can disarm that protein target and hopefully lead to therapeutic benefit. And this discipline of so-called discovery and then medicinal chemistry is also really advanced. So genomic medicine comes along at a really good time. Well, in the time that I was training in, with an interest in blood cancers, something very different was happening in a disease called chronic myeloid leukemia. You might know that cancer really requires two types of genetic events, one that causes cells to grow forever, forever and the other one that causes them not to differentiate normally. My son's blood is on fire. It's growing, but it, it continues to make red cells, white cells, and platelets. A cancer just grows and grows and grows and largely manufactures just one type of cell. And this chronic myelogenous leukemia well, was an awful cancer to have. It was treated with hormonal agents and eventually um, protein hormonal agents and then eventually um, stem cell transplantation. But it was really a model system for understanding the hard wiring of a cancer. And so these are red blood cells, these little donuts. And these large cells are the cancer cells admixed throughout the bloodstream. And you can see that the prevalence of this cancer increases with age. It's a cancer of adult patients. It equally affects men and women. And the symptoms are, are quite bad. Um, People exhausted. They stop manufacturing the good red blood cells, the platelets. They bleed. They're tired. They develop infections and ultimately die. But Janet Rowley and other scientists characterize that at the chromosomal level, chromosome 9 had an extra fragment uh, attached to it. And this is a translocation, a swapping of dance partners amongst the human chromosomes. And this so-called Philadelphia chromosome had a bit of chromosome 22 lost down here and added to chromosome 9. The molecular biologists figured out that when these two proteins intersect, these two chromosomes intersected, they formed a new protein that doesn't exist anywhere in the genome. The fusion of a protein called a gene called BCR with a gene called ABL. And that this new protein that doesn't exist anywhere in the normal human body, that this protein could cause cancer cells to grow. And so if you had this cancer, you might say, well, wow, can I have the ABLE inhibitor? And they say, well, we don't have an ABLE inhibitor. And you say, well, why? They're like, well, because cancer drugs are supposed to make you really sick. 
make your hair fall out, and you can't probably inhibit ABL because ABL is one of like 500 other proteins called kinases, and it just would be very hard to make a selective inhibitor of ABL. And this was sort of the dogma. I mean, it's almost crazy to tell this story so many years later. But a young and enterprising biologist, Brian Drucker, then at Dana-Farber and ultimately in Oregon, teamed up with a, a group of pharmaceutical chemists at Siba Geigy who had not believed this rhetoric and said, well, maybe we'll just try to make protein kinase inhibitors. And they exchanged reagents and ideas, something that nowadays actually is not that easy to do. And they gave him prototype drugs, drugs that maybe they weren't ready to go into the human, but they knew that they were able inhibitors. And he mixed them with cells from patients uh, that had this chromosomal translocation. And what he witnessed was that these cells stopped growing and that other dividing cells grew just fine. And this established the concept of targeted therapy for emerging cancer oncogenes. And it was published in Nature Medicine with not a whole lot of fanfare, but when this substance got to the clinic, there was actually quite a lot of fanfare. It rapidly moved through the dose-finding phase one studies into the effect-determining phase two studies. And it was so exciting, this observation, that it actually changed our understanding of the incidence of the disease. People literally came out of the woodwork with this cancer, particularly older patients. And if you look at the effect, it wasn't subtle that the survival of patients in blue and the survival of patients without progression to acute leukemia, a common consequence of this cancer, was so striking that even in the index dose-finding studies, they were observing dramatic responses. And so this really opened up everyone's eyes uh, to the idea that understanding the genetics would lead to understanding the biology, would lead to identification of a well-qualified or validated target could potentially lead to a targeted substance that could then be deployed in a specific population for a specific reason at a specific time, the tenets of personalized medicine. And so I guess after this happened, it so changed the dogma that we were like, man, this is going to work every time. And we'll probably cure cancer in the next three or four years. And it did feel like that. I mean, this disease that in the 1900s was treated with arsenic and radiating the spleen, this chemical derivative of the nitrogen gas, combination chemotherapy, transplantation, now was a pill that you take every day. And so long as you take the pill and have access to it through your in insurance, um, well, you're, you're disease-free. It's unclear if you're cured, but you're disease-free, and you have a great quality of life. And so people started to wonder, well, what are the other drivers of cancer and the other diseases, and could this Gleevec or imatinib hit those targets too? And Dave Tubison and George Dimitri at Dana-Farber put two and two together, and they said, wow, there's this horrible tumor called the gastrointestinal stromal tumor that fills up patients' abdomens. It's very aggressive and lethal, and it's actually activated by a gene called KIT. And Gleevec, that CML drug, it was made for ABL, but it kind of accidentally hits KIT. And they thought, wow, we're going to repurpose imatinib for this kit-dependent um, uh, cancer, and they did. And here's a slide from George showing a patient who by PET scan has uptake of this glucose-addicted cancer in the liver, and it's completely silenced 10 years after the initial treatment with this drug. And now when you have a patient, they come in with a big mass in their stomach, you're kind of hoping it's just, because there's something you can do about it. So we all got very excited that this was going to be uh, the, the rule, not the exception. And I think what, I don't want to summarize too broadly because you can't win when you do that, but my experience has been beyond these two examples, we actually are getting very good at finding the targets. We're getting pretty good at making the inhibitors, but the special thing about GIST and chronic myeloid leukemia is not that the diseases respond, but that they keep responding for such a long, long time. Because now that this dogma is out, drugs were developed that target the epidermal growth factor receptor, very important for lung cancer. This is a CAT scan of lung. And this lung is wide open for business full of air. This one here is full of cancer. And this is a patient I took care of with Tom Lynch at Mass General when I was training there. And, and this cancer 
dramatically responds to exposure to a targeted agent against this tyrosine kinase. But it does grow right back. This recent story of acute myeloid leukemia that depends on the FLT3 oncoprotein has led to the development of a number of different drugs that target FLT3 in acute myeloid leukemia. And some of these patients, here from my colleague Rich Stone at Dana-Farber, the head of our leukemia group, their blood counts, extraordinarily high with acute leukemia, drop and respond to this drug. And that decrease is sustained for a period of days. And then the cancer blows through. And more recently, with quite a bit of fanfare, there were molecules developed for melanoma, a truly horrible disease that target one of the driving cancer proteins called BRAF. And this gentleman from Florida in his late 30s responded dramatically to a targeted substance from a company then called Plexicon. But unfortunately, less than a few months later, his disease progressed. So as a doctor, you're very excited that drugs are finally being developed for these diseases. They absolutely should be FDA approved. They should go into combination studies. They should be mixed with hormonal and immunological and maybe even stem cell transplantations by clinicians in an innovative way to find the right cocktail. These drugs are active, but they're different. And this is now more the norm, I would say, uh, well, than the exception. So now we're trying to figure out why this is. Why do cancers such as this gentleman's become resistant? And this comes from a fantastic study by Levi Garraway from the Broad and Dana-Farber to understand at the genetic level what is changing in this man so quickly that causes the cancer to grow. And what they found, I don't want to speak for him, is that the cancer actually had genetic changes that were selected, like evolutionary pressure in the body, and that these cells, resistant cells, will they grow out immediately. This points to the complexity of cancer at the moment that it's diagnosed, which now, thanks to genome medicine, we understand at the single base pair resolution. Where we used to think of cancer like this, this 30,000 foot view of what do the chromosomes look like, and there's a blue one next to a yellow one. Now we zoom in and can read the code. We can see the soul of this cancer. And as we're doing this now in individual cancers, in one year we'll do it on all the cancers in patients' body, and in two and five years we'll do it on all the patients and all the cancers in their body. And we will have, like modern cartographers, a complete genetic map of the diversity of their cancer genome. Some of the early studies that have illustrated this are kind of scary because you see numerous cancer-causing proteins that by themselves would be enough to get cancer, they're all there functioning together. And at the heart of it, I don't play poker, but I know a lot of people do, so I made this slide. I hope you like it. Um, this is Texas Hold'em. And the dealer flops these three cards that everyone has access to, but they're all holding their own cards. And all a cancer has this hard wiring that depends on this common circuit, MIC the loss of the brakes, P53, an active signaling protein called KRAS. This is the majority of human cancers. But the primary cancer might be driven by EGFR and PI3K, and it gets a drug and it responds. But the brain metastasis has a pair of mutations, and it wins the hand. So really, the only way to defeat cancer is to have drugs at your disposal for not just all of the cancer drivers, but all of the genetic flavors of all of the cancer drivers. So to bring the principle of targeted therapy, a specific molecule for a specific protein with a specific mutation in a specific patient in a specific time in their disease that emerged out of the successful development of Gleevec and CML is very, very hard and maybe not possible. So we're just forced to wonder then, well, what else can we do? And I will say that as I was training as a doctor, there were these stories like Gleevec in GIST and in CML, but then there were these drugs in my discipline of blood cancers like arsenic and thalidomide and bendamustine 
I mean, this is a direct synthetic derivative of nitrogen mustard gas, just very recently approved. And these are impactful substances, and they deserve to be FDA approved. But it seemed that we had to be able to do better. And this really, for me, was driven home when my dad developed pancreatic cancer. Now, he lived in Chicago. And at the time that he was diagnosed, I was here at the Broad. We had access, I suppose, to every conceivable type of genetic test. We could have deeply sequenced his genome, but we didn't do it. We didn't even fly him to Boston because there's no mystery what causes pancreatic cancer, at least not the majority of cases. And that the genes that cause pancreatic cancer, the KRAS oncoprotein, the MYC oncoprotein that it depends on, the loss of P53, that this is old information that we've had for 20 or 30 years, and still we have no drugs for them. So as a field, it really made me feel like these fringe populations, this low-hanging fruit, these tyrosine kinases that were hard when they made ABLE, but now are maybe quite a bit more straightforward, well, that the companies were on this. And they were chasing each other's tails to make better derivatives of all these compounds. But could we have confidence in the system that it would develop new and creative molecules for intractable targets? If you have Burkitt's lymphoma and you come to my clinic and you say, why do I have cancer? I say, oh, it's because the, the MYC gene is translocated to the immunoglobulin gene and it just never shuts off. And you say, well, turn it off. They go, we don't have a drug that can do that. I say, well, give me the MYC inhibitor. You say, well, we, we don't have a MYC inhibitor. They like, well, did you just discover this? No, no, we don't since the 80s. I'm like, well, what's wrong with you? Where's the MYC inhibitor? And the answer, the scientific answer is, it's too hard. It makes too hard. It's like looking for the keyhole on the wall. Where, where do you stick this molecule? So, um, so against this clinical experience and in the flood of this genetic information, I went back to school um, at Harvard Chemistry and then here at the Broad and studied with a, a brilliant man here at the, at the Broad, Stuart Schreiber, who had really been an innovator for many years in how you discover and make molecules better to basically retrain uh, in discovery chemistry. It's quite a bit different, I can tell you, uh, um, in the 15 years that elapsed since I had last taken a chemistry class. And I cut my teeth with Stuart making new types of drugs for multiple myeloma, very selective drugs that compared to pharmaceutical compounds increased in their potency. This is their effect over a range of concentration. And learned from this process that making molecules was so easy even a doctor could do it, if you had the right infrastructure, if you had chemists in proximity to biologists, in proximity to geneticists, going to the same cafeteria, walking through the same staircase, attending the same meetings. And it struck me through this experience that my interest to sort of go and work in a pharmaceutical company leading drug discovery and making a proper living was really, uh, well, that there was this other opportunity and that if we had our own lab and made our own drug molecules, it didn't really matter if the market size was too small or if the target was too hard. Those are exactly the kind of challenges that are good for an academic center. And so we pushed on. We made a molecule for cutaneous T cell lymphoma. It's a lymphoma that grows throughout your skin. It's an awful disease. And there was an idea that this one class of drug called HDAC would work. The problem is most of the patients with this cancer are treated by dermatologists, meaning they feel pretty good. But they have cancer. They're never going to get sick enough to need the types of medicines that were developed for that cancer. So we made what we called soft drugs, cancer chemotherapeutic agents that you wipe all over your skin. But when they get into the bloodstream, they're immediately eliminated by ancient enzymes in our blood called esterases, so that the toxic cancer drug goes to the skin where the cancer is, but it never makes it to the heart to make your heart stop beating, or to your brain to make you vomit, or to your hair follicles to make your hair fall out. In fact, when we started treating mice with this cancer, hair started to grow. We thought, we are rich. <laughs> <laughs> now, in this case, fortunately and regrettably, the reason the hair was growing is the cancer was going away and the hair follicles literally were coming back to life. Since that time, we started to think even beyond cancer, making highly selective drugs in this target class for sickle cell disease, making versions of these molecules that could be used to treat malaria parasites that also have 
um, this protein family. Because it didn't matter to us that malaria is not a good market, that you'll never make money with malaria. We thought, well, people would be, would be interested in at least our publications, and that maybe if we drop the activation energy so low to say, oh, we, I know it's a bad project, but we actually have the molecule. If you could just make a pill, you, I'm sure you'll be able to get something for it. And so we thought, well, this was really addictive. So I want to finish this talk by telling you a recent story in the minutes that remain about a cancer that very much represents the new model of cancer, a cancer defined by its genotype, not by its site of origin, about the protein that causes this cancer and about a molecule developed in our lab by a young chemist named Jun Chi, JQ1. He's not vain. We named it for him. Uh, and how this, I think, is a model for the way in which um, cancer drugs can be developed outside of uh, the pharmaceutical world and in what we call the open source model. So this cancer is called midline carcinoma. It can arise in the chest, the bone, the face. Um, it can pop up anywhere. But what these, this cancer sh has in common is that it has a common genetic event the rearrangement of two chromosomes that put a protein called BRD4, not named for Bradner, that would be very cool, next to another protein called NUT that we have no idea what it does. But if you have this translocation, anywhere in your body, a cancer occurs. And this cancer is lethal. Almost uniformly, there's one person who's ever survived this cancer. It does not respond to chemotherapy or radiation. You can't cut it out. And it grows in bad places, like around the heart. But we understand this BRD4 protein and what it does now. It's a bookmark. It's a post-it note. When cancer winds up its DNA and it divides and it unwinds it again, it remembers that it's cancer because BRD4 and other proteins of its family are placed throughout the genome that say, I'm a growth gene. Turn me back on after you're done dividing. Now, there are other bookmarks that say, don't ever turn me on again. I'm a liver gene. We're not making liver. We're making cancer. And there are groups, hopefully more groups, studying those bookmarks. But these bookmarks were not studied by drug discoverers because they thought a protein that binds to another protein is just sort of a crummy target. That's not a, that's not a low hanging fruit, that's high hanging fruit. And this cancer, if there are no drugs for my dad who had pancreatic cancer, a relatively common one, who's gonna make a drug for a cancer that has 10, 15 patients a year? It's not a very good business model. So we thought this was a perfect project for us. So we made this molecule called JQ1 based on many insights, largely from pharmaceutical companies. It's a class of drugs that have been used in sedatives, like Xanax if you need to kind of chill out, or Versed if you need a colonoscopy. But if you modify these drugs right here with this big bulky group, it's like throwing an elbow to this sleeping receptor. You don't fall asleep. But the rest of this molecule, shown over here, in a three-dimensional way, fits perfectly into this little pocket. And this is like licking the adhesive on a post-it note. It can't bind anymore. It's stuck with this molecule. And so not being a drug company, we did something very, I don't know, unwise. We just started sending it to people. We thought, we'll do a social experiment. And we'll have to give something away, I suppose. But my lab is small. There are eight of us. Uh, and we'll just start mailing it to our friends. And they can tell us what it does, if it does anything interesting. And so we sent it to Oxford University. And they generate that beautiful picture of our molecule binding its target. We sent it to Brigham and Women's Hospital that had numerous patient-derived specimens of this aggressive, small, rapidly dividing cell. And working closely with Chris French, who discovered this cancer, what we found is that this cancer was changing shape when exposed to our drug. And it stopped dividing. The cancer cells were turning into normal cells. And it was like a skin that you could peel off the bottom of the Petri dish. Very strange, very cool. So we submitted this to a fancy journal, and the feedback we got was, this is very cool, but this is the time in a project you really ought to start treating some mice. <laughs> and uh, um, the problem was there was no mouse model of this cancer at that time. But I was caring for this 29-year-old firefighter from Connecticut who's very much at the end of life with this tumor from his PET scan encasing his heart and constricting his lung from opening. And we had a tube in his chest that would allow him more time with his children and family that would minimally re-expand his lung. And it was just draining cancer. And every nursing shift, we'd throw it out. So we approached him and asked, um, 
Could, would he collaborate with us? Could we take this precious material, this zebra that we only see once every few months, this cancer, and uh, would he give it to us to grow in mice and to do a clinical trial in animals? With the drug, it'd be illegal to give to him, and importantly so, but that if positive in mice could lead to the development of that molecule in his cancer for other patients to come. I know, we're, we're, we're almost there. <laughs> so we brought this mo uh, this, these cells uh, without ever touching plastic to Andrew Kung at the Lurie Family Imaging Center at Dana-Farber, and he got them growing in immunocompromised mice. And we grew these huge, large tumors on their hind limb and treated them with drug, and this red, intense uptake of sugar, this sign of aggressiveness, went away. We took these large tumors and we divided them into cohorts of animals, all with the same cancer, all from the same patient, but now statistically we could assess whether the drug worked. And the mice that did not receive the drug died quickly, and the ones that did will live for quite a long time. We got cells from other patients. We did the same, and we've now tested in four different models that this molecule, at least for mice with this cancer, is a targeted therapeutic agent. And so we got excited, and I would say that at a drug company, this is the time when you start keeping the secret, and you turn the molecule into a pill, and you file a bunch of patents, and you start your clinical trials, and you stop going to meetings. And so we thought, this is a social experiment, we'll, we'll do the opposite, and I know not all companies do that. Um, so we published it, and what's more, we told people exactly what it looks like. We told people exactly how to make it. We gave them our email address to say, if you email me, I'll probably send it to you too. <laughs> and, uh, and we did. And um, since December, when this paper came out online, we've shipped the molecule to over 70 labs worldwide, 40 in the United States alone. Sometimes because we had an idea that it might work for a given cancer or non-cancerous disease, sometimes to study something we had no idea about, but when they called, we were like, yes, definitely. You should try this molecule. And Jun sends it out the next day. They'll send it to a drug company, a government agency, Mass General Hospital, our rival. I'm just kidding. Um, but we have. We've given it to all of these people. And what we now know is beyond just this rare cancer, leukemia cells treated with this drug forget their leukemia cells, and they turn into healthy white blood cells. We know that in multiple myeloma, these aggressive blood cells that live in the bone marrow space, they stop dividing. And one of the most prolific cancer proteins known to man, MYC, is silenced and turns off. It shuts down the growth program. And these mice respond. This project taught us something, a little bit about science, but quite a bit more about strategy, about the way in which we as an academic center can leverage the incredible infrastructure in the Boston biomedical area. It is a candy store for scientific research, and you surely appreciate that. But by organizing ourselves and championing projects, bringing in specialists in each of these disciplines, largely, if not exclusively, within academia, that we can move projects very, very quickly in advance of their funding, in a competitive manner, even with the most ambitious pharmaceutical companies, and then just distribute these compounds as chemical probes at a time when, well, they can be most informative about how you might ultimately develop the drug. So this is our effort to be, to sort of import things that have worked so well in the tech sector, like the idea of open source, like the idea of crowdsourcing information, but applying it to drug discovery at a time where targeted therapies have never been more urgently needed. This is not my expertise, but a recent issue of Nature Biotechnology highlighted the way in which the economic experience of the world now is putting real pressure on pharmaceutical companies to be profitable every quarter. And there are targets that I will tell you might never work, like MIC. And those are tough targets that everybody should be working on. But there aren't a lot of active MIC programs now in pharma. And I understand that if I ran that business, I might make the same decision. But who then will develop innovative drugs for these difficult targets? And the answer, new drugs studied in a different article largely come, the majority of them come, from universities collaborating with biotech companies. So we'll do anything to help a drug company make a better molecule. But I do think that this largely accidental production of drugs from universities, now in a more organized way, and we're not the only people doing this, thankfully, worldwide, um, has the potential uh, to unlock new and creative types of cancer therapies. Our pipeline is agnostic. 
as to what discipline, an MD, a PhD, an undergrad, associate professor, which by the way, I'm not, I'm an assistant professor, but I appreciate the promotion. Um, <laughs> doesn't really matter. We just want to work with people that are motivated, that get it, and that are passionate, creative, um, that have Skype. Uh, <laughs> and so what we did now with JQ1 is we try to push our boundaries even further and to make the pill version of JQ1 so-called JQ2. And these molecules are very, very potent. They're very, very selective. And they're at the point now where really they have all the properties of a drug molecule. We just need to give them to somebody who will put them into humans, which ethically, of course, we can't do. As the inventors of these molecules, it would be unacceptable to treat our patients. I don't believe that, but those are the rules. And so this molecule is going into a local biotech company called Tensha, the Japanese word for to transcribe or turn on genes. But we've learned from this process as well that once we have the prototype drugs, there are lots of people excited about developing them as therapeutics. And so we've developed discovery platforms to find molecules for new targets. The topical molecule at Shape Pharmaceutical go goes into the clinic in two weeks. It'd be the first drug from our lab here at Broad and at Dana-Farber to, to go into a human, which means we're really doing drug discovery, not just chemistry. The HDAC6 inhibitor for myeloma goes into the clinic in one week. Not at our institution, we're not allowed, um, uh, but at Mass General right across town. And then a series of molecules here to come. Well, anyway, I want to sort of just leave you with this. I hope you're not a trademark lawyer. Um, and uh, <laughs> and um, want to finish, I guess, where I started, and that's by thanking you. Our business model involves really all of you. Uh, the scientists as collaborators, uh, the citizens of Cambridge as people who bike in the Pan Mass Challenge, um, as American citizens who pay taxes. This is all funded and fueled by all of you. And that, too, is a special thing about the Boston area. I've never seen anything like it, a state, a city, a region that rallies so much around cancer. Um, and there was only one question, so I thank you. Uh, but I'm, I'll be here for a while if you have uh, questions, comments, dissenting opinions. All are welcome. Thank you. Yes. It's a great question. Are we curing mice? Turns out not to be so easy to cure mice. I know everyone's like, oh, you can cure cancer in a mouse. It's actually not that easy. Um, in our index experiments, the mice lived so long we ran out of drug. And we stopped and said, did we cure them? And we hadn't. Uh, clones within the tumor grew back, some of which are still sensitive to the drug. We're trying very hard to anticipate clinical resistance. In this case, we can't seem to engender it. So we have yet to find the resistant clone in mice. We're working very hard to figure that out. But as long as mice stay on JQ1 with that cancer, they remain in a continuous responsive state. But I wouldn't call them cured for five years, and mice don't live that long anyway. OK. First of all, loudly. Loudly. Congratulations on the open source thing. This is really dynamite, and I hope you get a huge prize for that. That is super. And um, the second thing, this is a hard question, but very naive. After all of this work on cancer cells, the curious thing of this eternal generation of these cells, it, no matter what type, of cancer it is. There's this underlying principle, right? It, it does this berserk thing. Do they understand that principle any better? So the question is, to what extent does science understand the berserk, and I like that, endless growing of cancer cells? Uh, I would say that's the part of cancer that we really do deeply understand. We understand the signals. We understand the proteins that implement the signals. We understand biophysically the mechanics of DNA copying itself, assembling itself. There's so much knowledge there. There are actually a lot of still really good targets within that now boring type of target cell division. right? The chemotherapeutic agents that I prescribe that cure people, 
with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, by and large, target that machinery, the growing part, the actual physical copying of DNA and div dividing of a cell. That biology is still very rich with targets. There's plenty of things we don't yet understand adequately enough to know which keyhole is the key keyhole. Um, but that's a very rich piece of biology. The challenge with understanding that from a drug discovery standpoint is you still have to make blood. You still want to make hair. The lining of your stomach still needs to form crypts and fingers that will absorb nutrients. Your body, though we're not growing anymore, on the inside, we're replenishing all the time. So the part of your question that we don't quite precisely answer are what are the components of the growing machinery that a specific cancer so depends on that the normal growing parts of your body don't, right? And, uh, and that identification of targets that would have a, then a therapeutic window is very, very active field of research. Yes. How does that, and my understanding of patents is it means the company basically can ban anyone from working on treatment for those diseases. How does that, does, has that had an impact on the open source, oh. The idea, Sorry. yeah. The open source model and your ability to develop new targeted therapies? Right. So the question, I think you heard most of it, is um, companies are, are, are attempting to defend patents um, that are being challenged now, importantly, uh, around different genes. And um, it's fair to say that uh, the moral public and the government agencies and largely the pharmaceutical companies are against that. And so my sense is this won't carry the day, but it's actively being prosecuted in court. Largely those patents, and I'm not an expert in this, are around the use of those genes for diagnostic purposes. Not that if anybody ever makes an inhibitor for MYC, I got the patent on that. Those types of patents really, really don't exist. Or if they do, if they have issued somehow, they, they won't hold up. Because the most important patent for a molecule, as was learned through the development of COX-2 inhibitors for inflammation and other things at the Supreme Court level, the most important patent for a molecule is the structure of the molecule itself. The drawing of the Swifter protects the Swifter. You can then use it to clean your car, to clean your house, to do all kinds of things. But if you want the Swifter, you got to buy it from a certain person. And so in the patent world, the structure of the molecule is so valuable that that's the biggest threat to the open source model. I just salivate when I think of the cool molecules Novartis must have that aren't ready to be pills, but that you could really learn from if everybody had them. And we might find some new use for it, as we once did with their drug LBH589 and multiple myeloma. And we made it ourselves. Even, I guess, at the time, really think if that was an issue with patents. I actually don't want to know, so please don't tell me. <laughs> and we found this incredible data in a blood cancer. We made a meeting with them. And we said, look, we, we have this incredible data with your molecule. Would you like to do a clinical trial? They're like, how did you get our molecule? They're like, well, we made it. And they're like, well, how did you know the structure? We said, well, we found it on Google. <laughs> and, uh, and we had. And they said, well, did you patent this? We said, no, it's your molecule. They're like, oh, great, let's do a clinical trial. <laughs> and, and off to the races. And so I tell you that to tell you this. They're very shrewd. And that effort to use and make their molecule to show them this new use for it led to an immediate clinical trial. And that drug probably will be approved in that indication. And it happened faster, the whole project faster, than you could execute a material transfer agreement with our or their institution. So the open source model, I would argue, so benefits pharmaceutical companies if they buy in that I would say they don't even have to give us their precious drug molecule. Keep it off Google. Give us one that's chemically similar enough that we can learn enough in mice and then go ahead and develop your drug. I'm an American. I think that's good for the economy to create a product to um, generate money that leads to jobs and people that can sell molecules. That's good, right? Um, but these things are not opposed. They're not opposed at the gene patenting level, which would never hold up for drug development, to answer your question. And they don't, they, 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 they don't hold us back, I don't think, um, for applying this sort of open distribution model to even drug company molecules. And there are companies like GlaxoSmithKline that are start, and Pfizer, that are starting to 
release the hounds. It's very exciting. Uh, could you say a few words about uh, the prospects for possibly being able to predict whether certain cancer will become resistant or not based on knowledge of the signaling networks and the protein targets that you're hitting with your molecules? Great. So you heard the question. It's a very tough question, I'll tell you, and I won't be able to answer it completely. Um, but I can tell you my sense of that literature. So I have focused in this talk on really one type of resistance, and that's where a mutation occurs in a protein that makes the key no longer fit. Gatekeepers, evolving resistance. But there's a different type of resistance that involves signaling networks, and that's more plasticity. You see, these growth signals typically come in to a cell in the normal circumstance from the outside in. They tickle the cell and say, it's time to grow. And that signal's transmitted into the nucleus where the DNA is, and the growth genes are then turned on. That's normal. Abnormal is where the signaling molecule doesn't need the signal anymore. It's just on because it's mutated. And you make an inhibitor of that target, the signal stops, and transiently, at least for a few weeks, the cell stops growing. But when it starts growing again, sometimes it's because the key no longer fits in the keyhole to a, due to a second mutation. Sometimes, because the cancer says, well, then I'll use the other growth pathway. I don't, you know, that's not the only growth pathway that I need. And that plasticity, uh, which incidentally Levi Garway well characterized in this paper about, mel about melanoma as in a, a type of evasive resistance um, uh, in that disease with that targeted therapeutic that my friend Jeff Engelman characterized in lung cancer after patients ceased to respond to the EGFR resistance. That biology is so emerging right now that I would say we can't possibly estimate the w numerous ways in which cancer cells can escape one pathway of growth to recruit the others. So if we can't understand the extent of the problem, we certainly can't appreciate it at the time of diagnosis. So then how might it work? Um, measurements, biological measurements at the single cell level collect a massive amount of data about the signaling networks that are on or could be recruited, understand the three-dimensional structure of chromatin to know what are the recruitable elements of the genome and what just can't be recruited, and then to rely on people like Aviva Gev here and other biostatistical geniuses to say by pathway analysis and emerging mathematical models that at least these are the three or four that you might think of first. Because if you knew that in a predictive way, well, you might stop evolution the way in HIV we know to give a reverse transcriptase inhibitor and a non-reverse transcriptase inhibitor at the same time. Right? So as you saw that pathway slide, and as you clearly appreciate by asking, the pathways are complicated. They're quite redundant. They're quite plastic. It's a real challenge. So the way we're trying to anticipate that is to go to the nucleus where the action is. Take away the memory proteins. Make it hard. Take away MYC take away the, the driving force of, of cancer growth, make it hard for plasticity to occur.